We are continuing to follow breaking news out of Kansas City, Missouri. At least one person was killed in a shooting near the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl victory parade this afternoon. 22 people also suffered gunshot wounds in the incident. Police say they have detained three suspects. So I want to bring in Ed O'Keefe, who is our senior White House and political correspondent, joining us from the North Lawn of the White House. Ed, what can you tell us about the briefing given to the president, such as you know about it, or any other details from the White House perspective? So many times, Ranger, we've had to repeat these words that, in fact, the White House is monitoring the situation and providing federal assistance to state and local authorities. That's what's happened again here today. Uh, the president learned about it this afternoon. Uh, there is an Office of Gun Violence Prevention that's been established uh, by this administration that tracks these kinds of incidents and provides assistance to communities should they need it. Uh, in, in this case, it being a larger city and a larger event, there would have been more federal eyes on this uh, event anyway. Uh, so it's unclear, at least so far, and we've asked what that uh, new office has been up to today in responding and monitoring to this situation. Uh, but as you said, it, it's yet another incident and another kind of mark of American society that's had to deal with gun violence today. And in watching the coverage throughout the day, you could just see how upsetting this was for Kansas City Chiefs fans and those that were in attendance uh, to have to know that at the end of it, it ended this way. Yeah, as I'm sure you took note, the mayor of Kansas City said, I'm angry. The police chief of Kansas City said, I'm angry. The police chief, Stacey Graves, said, this is not Kansas City. It may not be. And I certainly, having traveled to Kansas City many times, know that it's not Kansas City writ large, but it happened nonetheless. And I know that at when I covered the Obama White House at times like this, and I'm sure you feel it at the Biden White House, there is a sense of powerlessness at moments like this? Absolutely. And, and, and you know, it's, it's something that they've had to respond to too many times over the last three years or so. It's part of why they stood up that new Office of Gun Violence Prevention to help communities, not only in the immediate aftermath of one of these shootings, uh, but over the several weeks or months after. And they're more, cons I think, more focused on assisting places like Uvalde, Texas, or other smaller communities that may have suddenly seen this kind of mass violence occur, uh, not to diminish at all uh, the importance or the seriousness of what happened in Kansas City today, but to provide resources to places that may not be as prepared uh, for what comes after this kind of violence. So we'll see if we hear anything more from the president of the White House uh, through the rest of tonight or tomorrow. Uh, but again, as, as I said at the beginning, it, it was the sort of typical White House response, which is we're aware of it, we're monitoring it, we've offered assistance, uh, and, and we're obviously uh, upset about what transpired. Ed O'Keefe at the North Lawn of the White House Force. Thanks so much. We will have more on the response to the Kansas City shooting when we come back. You're streaming American Sucks. Welcome back. We are continuing to follow the breaking news out of Kansas City, where one person has been killed in a shooting near the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl victory parade and celebration. I want to go now to Tiffany Null, who was at the parade. She joins us via Zoom. Tiffany, thank you very much for your time. I don't want to impose upon you in any way. I just want you to say what you remember, how it affected you, and give our audience a sense of what you saw, please. We were just there having a great time. There were a lot of people, like we were shoulder to shoulder. Um, I was standing on top of a cooler because um, I couldn't see. And um, at this point, I had heard, I, there were so many different noises going on at that point. You didn't really know what was what, but I heard a pop. And then you just heard screaming and everybody in front of me just started running. And I, I started yelling, what's going on? What's going on? And a, a woman yelled, they're shooting, they're shooting. And we jumped, I jumped down the lady next to me. We start, we just started running and my husband, we turned around and we just, we left everything. And then we didn't get, but maybe about 10, 15 feet from our stuff before they started saying they've got him, they've got him. And so we stopped and we started, you know, are you sure before we, you know, we started to go back, but everybody was still running and rushing and everybody was just bumping into each other. And it was just very chaotic. 
Tiffany, as you were there and as you were preparing to go to the parade, did you have any sense in your mind? Did you have any anxiety or fear that something like this might happen, meaning it is something that has happened in other communities in America? Did you go there with any sense of even low-level anxiety that something like this might occur? You know, I really, I really didn't. I always try to have like situational awareness, mm -hmm. but I wasn't, I wasn't afraid. Um, you know, I, I, we were down, we got there, we got there at like 730 in the morning to get a good spot. And we knew that we would be right up there in, with a lot, a lot of people. And I never even at the point where everything happened, I never felt unsafe. So even going into it, I didn't, you know, go, go in there. And even until the point happened, I, I didn't feel unsafe. And you mentioned that you got about 10 or 15 feet from your belongings when you heard they've got him. Did the crowd around you begin to stabilize and things begin to calm down? And were you able to go back? Did you feel safe enough to go back and retrieve your things? We we did once we once a lot of people started saying they got him instead of just one person, that a lot of people were like, they got him, they got him. Then we felt a little more, you know, a little better about going back and you know, grabbing our things and not continuing on, like, you know, getting out of there. We got our stuff, you know, we got our stuff. And then it was, you had nowhere to go that you just had nowhere to go. We couldn't go inside a building. We couldn't go. It was just, I mean, it, everything's outdoors and there's really nowhere to go. So, uh, so, Tiffany, how did you make your way out? How did you come up with a plan? And did you get any guidance either from others who were around you who were in the same boat or from anyone in a position of authority to lead you on a way out? No, at that point, they got um, over to the area. The police and the fire department and everybody got over to the area, and they just started blocking off the area and told us what area to not be in. And to they kind of like, corralled us all over into a to a certain area, you know, and told us to not go into this other area. Then there was another something else going on, like up the street that that was blocked off. So I don't know if that was related to this event or not related to this event. And so we were kind of stuck in the middle of these two events. And so we had to like ask for permission to go through this barricade to be able to go back to our cars. So it, it just to go back to our cars was a, a major feat. I don't doubt it. Before I let you go, Tiffany, a very simple question. Are you glad you went? You know, I am, I am. I, I've lived in Kansas city pretty much majority of my life. And I have rooted for the chiefs you know, the whole time and I've celebrated this and this is something that I wanted to experience. Is this something that I wanted to happen? Absolutely not. Um, will it stick with me? Yeah. The looks on people's faces as they were running the terror on their faces, I won't soon forget, but I'm glad that I went and celebrated our, our victory with our whole city. Tiffany Null, thank you so very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. CBS News Congressional Correspondent Scott McFarland joins us now from Capitol Hill. Scott, always good to see you. What have you heard from members of Congress this afternoon? We're in this ether on gun control issues in Congress, and it's almost like it goes through this choreography or this synchronization of responses after each mass shooting. Democrats and the Brady campaign to reduce gun violence put out these announcements saying we need to do something legislatively at the federal level to reduce the risk and the frequency of shootings. And you have, to some degree, a bit of silence from those who advocate gun rights.
after each mass shooting. And I'll note this, Major, from our CBS News reporting. There are these discharge petitions. We've heard these referenced mm -hmm. in the past few days discussing how do we get something on the floor to aid Ukraine. There are several pending discharge petitions right now on the issue of gun control that because they don't have 218 signatures, just sit there in that ether. There is an unfortunate rhythm that we're getting accustomed to that keeps beating along. I was looking that up just yesterday, Scott. I believe there are eight discharge petitions that have been filed. If my math and memory is correct, and there's always some problems there, six of the eight are related to gun violence mitigation measures. Scott, while I have you, I want to turn your attention and our audience attention ever so briefly to a somewhat significant development in House Democratic leadership regarding Jim Clyburn. No longer going to be a part of leadership, but he is going to run for re-election. Jim Clyburn, who has for so long been a part of House Democratic leadership and was the one who stayed on after Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer stepped back. Well, he's stepping back now, too. There's actually not enough leadership positions for everybody in the House Democratic Caucus who wants one. He's not leaving a void that necessarily needs to be filled in terms of a post. But his institutional memory and the heft he brings is something that Democrats can't really replace. But a succession plan is clearly in effect here for House Democrats, and this is another piece of it. Scott McFarlane on Capitol Hill, thank you so very much. Thank you. We are going to take a quick break, but we will be right back with more of our continuing coverage of the Kansas City shooting near the Chiefs Super Bowl parade. Stay with us. Welcome back to Washington. I'm Major Garrett. We will, I promise, continue to follow the breaking news out of Kansas City, Missouri. Police just informed us that 22 people were shot near the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl victory parade. If there are any additional updates from Kansas City, I promise you we will go back. But there are other topics to discuss. And I have two great journalists with me here at the table to help me do that, Kadia Goba and Molly Ball. Kadia is a political politics reporter. I'll spit that out at Semaphore. Molly is a senior political correspondent at The Wall Street Journal. Um, Kadia, let me start with you. Uh, any reaction that you've detected from lawmakers on Capitol Hill about this afternoon's tragic events? Yeah, so obviously a very divided Congress. So I don't mm -hmm. see any legislative fixes anytime soon. But I did get to speak to Jared Moskowitz, mm -hmm. who um, he's a graduate of Marjorie Stolen uh, Douglas. Mm -hmm. And as you know, today's a six year anniversary. Yes. And his comment was sort of like, this only happens in this country and you can't you can't make this stuff up, you know, an exasperated mm -hmm. reaction, as you would imagine. And then you think about like, Again, people are very splintered on this topic. It wasn't, it was just last year when Speaker Johnson just became Speaker. Mm -hmm. His comments were, you know, this is not about guns. This is, you know, people. About behavior, about it's about heart. mental illness, it's yeah. about other things, right? And there, to the degree there's been any Republican reaction, has it fallen into that category? Are they still sort of assessing the situation and not wanting to, quote unquote, politicize anything? I haven't seen any thoughts and prayers yet from that side. Understood, understood. Kadia, also, uh, there was a vote yesterday in the House of Representatives to impeach the Secretary of Homeland Security. It passed narrowly. Uh, had there not been a COVID diagnosis and a canceled flight for two Democrats, it would have failed yet again. What does that tell us about the current politics in the House of Representatives? Well, it definitely says that the majority is extremely slim, and uh, it, the chances of anything really progressing without Democrats really participating is just very unlikely. Like you said, that vote could not have happened. It could have failed yet another time like we saw it last week. It's just, it just speaks to the divisive, uh, the, the, how divisive Congress is right now and how anything that gets passed has to have bipartisan buy-in, period. And even when there are things that have bipartisan buy-in, Molly Ball, like a supplemental package that provides aid to Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan, and some of the harshest changes to immigration policy that any Democrats, in my experience in Washington, which is somewhat substantial, have ever agreed to, even that can't get across the line in the House of Representatives led by Republicans. That's right. And what we and, and as you as you say, these are uh, proposals that do have the support, we think, of the majority of the representatives in the House. If the, if the border package 
uh, were put to a vote on the floor, it would likely get a majority vote. If the, if the foreign aid by itself were put on the floor, it would likely get a majority vote. Uh, but the Speaker doesn't want to put it on the floor. I and think you can't vote for it unless it's on the floor. You can't vote for it if it's on the floor. And that's not even mentioning uh, the, the hijinks that have been happening on the Rules Committee that are also holding up floor action on a lot of legislation in the House. The House is just basically a mess, is the easiest way to put it. Uh, but that has serious consequences, right? It has consequences for our national security. It has consequences at the border. The Biden administration just today saying they're actually going to have to release a huge amount of asylum seekers from detention because they didn't get the funding that that border deal would have provided. So a very tangible consequence of the failure to come to an agreement on things like border security, you know, where the national security picture uh, in Ukraine, where the Ukrainian army says they're in danger of running out of ammunition, our allies in Israel also needing that military military aid that the president has has asked for and has not gotten in addition from to money that would be there for Palestinians and humanitarian Correct. assistance in humanitarian Gaza humanitarian aid in the package as well and all of it is bottled up because this divided Congress can't do anything, much less something even more controversial and polarizing, uh, like action on guns or crime, however you see the, the issue at play in, in what's happening in Kansas. I want to ask you both, Kadia, you can go first. Do you think there was kind of an interesting and noteworthy split screen moment last night. So the House of Representatives, about 7.30 Eastern last night, is voting to impeach the Homeland Security Secretary over disagreements about immigration policy. At the same time, the last of the voters in New York's Congressional District 3 are casting ballots in a race in which immigration was not a non-issue. It was a kind of prominent issue, especially down the stretch. And in that race, the Democrat wins and wins easily. And part of his closing argument, Tom Swasey, was, hey, Republicans killed something to deal with the immigration, flipping the script for Democrats who had been backpedaling on that issue for months. Do you think that's a split screen moment we should keep in mind and remember maybe two or three months from now? I mean, I think the split screen started last week when uh, the House was impeaching Mayorkas, but senators were trying to, you know, come to some kind of bipartisan agreement over uh, legislation. The very underlying issue. Correct. But in terms of New York 3, yeah, I think it's a learning lesson. It's a lesson for Democrats, I think, going forward, because he, Swazi kind of looked immigration in the face and said, yeah, this is a problem. We don't need to backpedal. We don't need to hide from it. Let's talk about this. Put it on the table. I think, I think you, when you talk to Democrats, they're, they're going to look that, look at that as an eye-opening moment and probably take on that in their 2024 election. Molly, your perspective? No, I think that's absolutely right. Look, there are a lot of local factors in this sure. race. Could, As there always are. It. As there always Ex are. Extensively, I think the Republicans had a flawed candidate. The Democrats had a very experienced one. This is a, a, a district that voted for President Biden, although, of course, it also voted for George Santos. And right. he was sort of looming over this race. But as Kadia said, you know, I think there was a lot of doubt about how this border issue would play. It was the topic of the overwhelming majority of the Republican ads against Tom Suozzi. And he could have run away from it. And I think a lot of Democrats would have counseled that and say, just run on abortion, just run on the things where we're strong. And instead, he was able to, again, execute this sort of complicated message of saying, yes, we know you don't trust Democrats necessarily on immigration, but I'm not like other Democrats in that regard. And also, here's Republicans not having a chance to fix the problem and refusing to take it. Right. And that that became a kind of advantage talking point for Tom Suozzi, the Democrat, and I was talking to Democrats two weeks ago saying, do you think you can fight this issue to a draw? And they're like, in our best days, maybe we can draw, draw, fight this issue to a draw. In this one particular instance, yes, there were other local factors. It was more than a draw. It turned to be a nominal nudging advantage. That may be the case. I mean, it's always problematic to over to overread over a special sure. election, right? Uh, and I think when we look forward to November, we know the border is going to be a marquee issue, in part because we know uh, 90, we're 90 percent sure that the Republican candidate is going to be Donald Trump, for whom this has always been the signature issue. And so I question whether, first of all, whether President Biden can execute a message on this issue as, as nimbly as Tom Suozzi did, but secondly, whether it's going to play the same way in an election with Trump, where he's going to be talking about building a wall, he's going to be talking in much harsher terms about immigrants and immigration. And we have seen that that there is that at least some segment of the public does respond to that. Molly Ball and Katia Goba, thank you so very much. 
We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more of our continuing coverage of the Kansas City shooting near the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl parade. Back in a minute. 